Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to fill out your attendance records and also please remember to uh, fill out the program evaluations and uh, if you could give us any ideas you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today I have the pleasure of reintroducing Dr. Larry Ottoman. Uh, Dr. Ottoman is a member of the Department of Hematology and Oncology at McFarland MGMC. He's board certified in internal medicine, uh, hospice and palliative care medicine and most germane to today's talk hematology and oncology, and he is here today to update us uh, on clinical pearls on iron deficiency and excess, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Ottoman. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> the thing that mostly qualifies me to give this talk is my gray hair, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll claim that as my certification. Um, this is going to be relatively uh, scattered. I tried to organize it as best I can. Uh, most of it will be about iron deficiency, uh, things that I've learned, things that I find interesting, some new things that I learned in preparing for the talk. And um, I'll be more than happy to answer questions as, uh, as we go along, if there's something really burning or at the end. So let's start with uh, uh, actually some data which I found very interesting, which is how do we know what's normal? And one of the ways of defining what's normal is to simply sample a very large uh, population. And this was the Scripps-Kaiser study in which they had, as you can see, over 10,000 men and women. They uh, excluded people who had obvious uh, causes to be anemic. They were uh, iron deficient either on the basis of iron saturation or ferritin, they were in renal failure, or they had some type of inflammatory condition. So it excluded all of those. And then they defined, well, if you want to call abnormal below uh, uh, in the 5% uh, percentile, or if you want to call abnormal as something that's below the 2.5% uh, percentile. And I think it was uh, quite interesting. If uh, we look uh, first at men, they're really the ones that vary a tremendous amount. <coughs> In men that were under the, between the ages of 20 to 59, uh, you can see that there was not much difference, but there was some. So they defined the lower limits of normal for hemoglobin for men in that age group as 13.7. Uh, with 5% uh, of men above and 5% of men uh, below normal. And, but in this group of men that were six years and older, you can see how much the normal value for hemoglobin falls. And um, I see a large number of referrals from uh, primary care providers for men over the age of 60 for a hemoglobin of 12.8. And so... Uh, it's just good to keep in mind that that's actually normal, even though our lab printout can't tell us that that's normal. Um, it is. Women change much less uh, with these uh, definitions. Age doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, and, uh, but the men, I thought, was quite interesting. Uh, the other question is, well, you know, can you tell anything by looking at a peripheral blood smear? This I quote primarily just because it comes from uh, where I trained at the Mayo Clinic and is an old study, 90 or 71, and they took blood smears uh, from patients that were known to be iron deficient, known to be normal, and uh, only uh, half of the slides were interpreted as iron deficiency anemia. And the same reader, whether they be staff or resident, uh, changed their opinion 20% uh, uh, of the time. So the peripheral blood smear uh, is usually not particularly helpful, uh, although I still look at them. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, I've recently begun using a, a receptor, the soluble transferrin receptor, and I wanted to explain why and how I think it might be helpful. Um, this, the transferrin receptor is on the surface of red cells and particularly uh, monocyte storage cells. And uh, it's one of those, the wisdom of the body things, that if there's iron deficiency, the cell wants more iron, so it expresses more 
receptors on the surface. And it's just a fact that uh, all receptors at some point come off of cells as the cells break down and so on. And so you can measure the presence of uh, transferrin receptor uh, in the serum. So I'm going to go through these different measurements. Uh, the ferritin, the soluble transferrin receptor, and then uh, hemoglobin levels here. And they define different uh, degrees of iron deficiency. So if everything is normal, uh, the hemoglobin is normal, the ferritin can vary all the way from here to here because, again, remember ferritin is a storage molecule. So you can draw down your stores quite a bit. You won't see any increase in the soluble transferrin receptor while all of this is intact. And then you can deplete your storage iron, and that's the case with uh, many adults, uh, mostly women, and what we can see is the ferritin continues to go down. And in this area, the soluble transferrin receptor starts to go up. And the hemoglobin just starts to come down. So a, de a depleted uh, storage iron, I'll talk a little bit more about, is difficult to define other than by the fact that the ferritin is finally below the normal limits for storage. This is the next category. And that is where the uh, iron is completely depleted, that the iron is also being depleted in terms of its transport form. And you can see that the tissues begin suffering iron deficiency. And those tissues are not only the tissues that we associate with iron, which is hemoglobin, but also uh, myoglobin, a, a very important muscle protein, and cytochromes, which are within the mitochondria, and I'll talk a little bit at, at the very end of the talk. But the point I want to make is that the hemoglobin may be dropping, but you also have to keep in mind that your iron requirements for these other tissues uh, is always there as well. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, patients who are iron depleted but not anemic and uh, the fact that they, inf they do have uh, physical symptoms as a result of that. And then there's iron deficiency where finally the hemoglobin falls uh, below normal in both men and women. So the soluble transferrin receptor um, goes up very fairly early on in iron deficiency. Uh, and the reason I find that helpful is uh, ferritin is also an acute phase reactant. So you will oftentimes have patients who have a normal ferritin um, and their C-reactive protein may be slightly high, I find those patients uh, are particularly helped or I'm helped in diagnosing those patients as having iron deficiency with the soluble transferrin receptor. It's not an acute phase uh, reactant. So if you have a patient who is slightly anemic, uh, they may have other symptoms of iron deficiency yet their ferritin isn't, quotes, below normal, uh, a soluble transferrin receptor can be helpful in that particular setting. So I mentioned that as a, a new test. These are just some pearls that I've learned as the years have gone on. Uh, the first one is, I think, mostly just fascinating, which is um, pica. Pica is Latin, uh, is the Latin genus for the magpie. Magpies apparently are indiscriminate in what they eat. Uh, and so... <laughs> That's where the term comes from. It's a compulsive ingestion of non-nutritional substances is the formal definition. I think the pica that I see almost exclusively in the patients I provide care to is a craving for ice. Um, and in the literature review that I did, there are really literally only two uh, uh, elemental deficiencies that result in craving for ice. One is iron deficiency, and the other is zinc deficiency, which I've never diagnosed. Taking a history of craving for ice is a lot like uh, taking a history of alcohol intake. If you ask an exaggerated question, you know that uh, they truly do have an ice uh, pica if they don't kind of hesitate to answer yes. We're talking 
two or three trays of ice cubes a day. Um, I had one woman who uh, packed a small freezer and would get a four pound bag of ice at the grocery store and would go into the ice all day long at work. So you can ask those kind of questions if they have anyone that accompanies them. Um, usually th uh, the thing that helps me is if I ask people if they have a craving for ice, the family member that accompanies them begins to roll their eyes, uh, which is a little bit like the, you know, do you think you drink maybe too much? And, you know, if their wife starts to roll their eyes, you know that they are. So um, the reason I find that ice pica is helpful is um, having never made the diagnosis of zinc deficiency, and maybe I've missed it, um, to me it, it's iron, it's, it's, it's as close to an absolutely reliable test as anything I know of. And if you have a patient with an ice pica, I oftentimes instruct my patients, if you start craving ice, just call. You know as well as I do, that means that your iron stores are depleted. And, um, you know, we don't need any fancy tests. Um, I've actually treated last week a woman that I was giving iron uh, therapy for. She had small bowel syndrome and wasn't absorbing oral iron. And she'd gotten 1,000 milligrams of iron. And she said, you know, I'm still craving ice. I started her up on more of the iron. Later that day, it turns out that her ferritin was only 15. Uh, but I had no doubt in my mind that this woman was still iron deficient. <coughs> there have been some studies about ice pica, which I found were interesting. Uh, these were all blood donors. Uh, blood donors are oftentimes iron deficient, which isn't surprising. They were asked about uh, ice craving pagophagia, and 11% uh, of all donors actually uh, admitted to that. Um, uh, uh, these are people that were iron deficient, I sh should say that. Um, and it tends to be much more common in women. I've never had a male patient with uh, ice pica. Uh, it, but it obviously happens because there were uh, some men in that group. But it's almost exclusively women. Um, one of the amazing things about uh, ice pica is that it goes away very quickly with iron repletion. And this simple observation uh, was predictive for iron deficiency anemia at the 73% level. <clears throat> if you recall, looking at a blood smear was about a 50-50 proposition. So uh, this is a surprisingly uh, reliable test, and it is reproducible. So if the same patient uh, had craving for ice when she first was diagnosed, um, if she has craving for ice again, she's always iron deficient again. I wanted also, uh, so a little pearl, hold that for what it's worth. I also wanted to uh, point out a paper that I found was uh, very interesting. This was about 10 years ago, published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. But it's, it's an observation that I've made for all of my career, and it's probably one that you've made as well. And it has to do with what happens to people's hematocrits when they go from upright which is what we define as normal, because those are the people that come into the office, to going to supine, and how quickly does that change? So they had healthy subjects, surprisingly they were all medical students, um, and they would measure plasma volume and hematocrit. Their standing hematocrit, 42%, pretty average, you know, for an average of men and, and women. Uh, and then they had those same people lie down, and within 30 minutes, their hematocrit fell from 42% to 38%. Now, that's over a gram of hemoglobin if you're thinking about it in those terms. It took 30 minutes, only 30 minutes for that to happen. If you take an older person uh, who is already dehydrated, uh, comes into our hospital, they're upright when they go to the emergency room, and the next day, after you've been giving them IV fluids, and their hemoglobin is two points lower, I can promise you those people are not suffering from a GI bleed. And a stool hemoglobin is not going to tell you what happened to that person. But this is probably the most common error that I see practiced in hospital medicine, which is to not take into account 
the fact that hematocrit is defined as normal in an upright, normally hydrated individual. And if you uh, take a person that's dehydrated and lie them down, I can promise you everyone's hemoglobin is going to drop. And uh, I think it's always good to keep that in mind. Um, excuse me. Um, iron absorption test I've used very rarely, uh, but it is sometimes helpful. Uh, simple concept, you have people get a serum iron, have them take iron orally. Uh, I just have them use their regular iron. That's what you want to know is are they absorbing it or not. And there's a tremendous amount of overlap, which is why it's not particularly helpful. But there is a difference. So people that are iron deficient um, tend to have a greater rise. Uh, the C here is the change. So the change in serum iron from uh, before ingestion to an hour after ingestion. So that's not the serum iron level. It's the increase in the serum iron level. So patients that are iron deficient uh, rise uh, considerably compared to patients who have the anemia of chronic disease who rise almost not at all. Uh, and uh, the normal person who's iron replete uh, does have a slight bump in their serum iron. Um, again, it's a test that's easy to do, um, and I've done it before in patients where uh, people often ask, well, why, you know, I'm taking iron, why isn't it working? And oftentimes um, it's been helpful to distinguish between people who have an ongoing GI blood loss, they absorb the iron fine, versus people who, for whatever reason, aren't absorbing their iron. One of the reasons that people are said not to absorb iron is uh, chronic use of uh, proton pump inhibitors. Another pearl to share with you. Um, it's pretty simple in concept. We all are aware of the fact that you need uh, acid in your stomach to convert uh, ferric to ferrous iron uh, in that um, if you interfere with acid production, you'll interfere with iron absorption. A lot of the papers that had to uh, do with the proton pump inhibitor uh, uh, didn't take into account what the patient's iron status was. And you can, in fact, and I'll show you a graph here shortly, you can, in fact, demonstrate that uh, patients who are replete with iron uh, do have an impairment in how efficiently they absorb iron. But there is good evidence to show that people that are iron deficient are not at all affected uh, by the use of proton, proton pump inhibitors. So the drive for the intestinal wall to allow the passage of iron is powerful enough that it overcomes the lack of acid uh, in the stomach. So um, it, it does interfere but it interferes in a meaningless way, and it doesn't interfere with someone who's actually iron deficient. So this is a graft of increase in serum iron in uh, patients who are iron replete. So these are patients who are on a proton pump inhibitor, and these are patients who are not. And it's easy uh, to show that there's a marked difference between iron absorption. So that's in iron patients that are iron replete. Um, that's actually a fact that I use in managing patients that have excess iron, and we'll talk about that at the very end. This is a very nice study uh, from Elementary Pharmacology and Therapeutics, a, a journal we all get, um, who uh, showed what the results of proton pump inhibitors were in, in ZE patients who are always on very high doses of PPIs and usually for the rest of their life. There was no difference in ferritin levels, uh, there was no difference in serum iron, and there was no difference in uh, hematocrit uh, in patients. So they, they don't become iron deficient because they're on uh, proton pump inhibitors um, uh, in the normal state of affairs. And then this is a little bit harder to see, uh, but this has to do with uh, patients uh, who uh, respond to iron. And the things to look at here is what the initial ferritin is. So if the patient uh, is on a proton pump inhibitor, their 
ferritin still rises, it goes from 13 to 56. If they're off the proton pump inhibitor, it'll go from 9.8 to 73.3. So they, they have a definite bump in ferritin. Um, in patients that aren't going to respond to iron, it really didn't make any difference whether they were on the proton pump inhibitor or not, going from 6 to 16 and 7 to 13. So uh, there's uh, good evidence that proton pump inhibitors don't interfere with iron absorption in a patient that needs iron. Unusual causes of uh, iron deficiency um, uh, that I've run in through the years, and I just mentioned them because they might uh, help you as you start seeing patients. Um, this is a really obvious one, but I've never had anyone pick it up. Uh, it's just a simple question, and I always ask it in every patient I see who's iron deficient. Are they a blood donor? And um, probably uh, maybe a dozen people over the years I've practiced were iron deficient because they donated blood. That was the source. Um, that's a lot cheaper than doing an upper and lower endoscopic evaluation. Uh, celiac disease uh, is a cause of iron deficiency due to malabsorption. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship between exercise and becoming iron deficient. Um, these are two entities that I di did not pay as much attention to until I began reviewing the literature, and that is the idea that patients who have uh, gastric pathology, either due to H. pylori or to what's called autoimmune gastritis, um, are a common cause of unusual causes <laughs> of iron deficiency. And this is based on a, a gentleman named Hershko who's, who sort of piloted this and uh, promoted it as his little area of expertise uh, with regards to the H. pylori and the autoimmune gastritis. Celiac disease, um, it's a diagnosis that you don't want to miss. Um, it can uh, be the presenting symptom uh, it can be present, rather, in anywhere from 12 to nearly 70% of patients with celiac disease. Um, iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia in patients with celiac disease, um, and it has to do with iron malabsorption. Rarely is it due to GI bleeding. And if you go backwards, uh, the chances of finding celiac disease in patients that are iron deficient is not great, but it makes such a huge difference in their management. So um, I never hesitate to evaluate the patient. Um, um, just a patient that I saw probably a month or so ago was a young woman uh, who came in with a well-documented iron deficiency. She wasn't responding to oral iron. She responded to intravenous iron. Um, and I, just as a matter of practice, I asked if she had any GI symptoms, none at all. Uh, I did a, a TTG. It was very high. I think it was 89 or something. It was incredibly high. Uh, biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of uh, celiac disease. And only when I went back and said, well, you know, you have celiac disease, she goes, well, I thought everybody's stomach kind of rumbled after pizza and beer. You know, she just didn't think anything about it. It wasn't florid diarrhea. Uh, she wasn't losing weight. Uh, but clearly, you know, she was gluten intolerant but, you know, didn't admit to those symptoms initially. So it's uh, always a good thing to keep in mind. This, I think, is a really fascinating thing, and I've seen a number of, uh, of patients. Um, uh, the majority that I believe are uh, iron deficient because of anemia uh, tend to be young women that are uh, perimenopausal and are obsessed with uh, long-distance running. That fits kind of the profile. Um, they all end up getting GI workups and stuff. But um, there's no doubt in my mind that this uh, does really exist. Um, it, iron deficiency in a, in a couple of studies was uh, common. Uh, it had to be in women athletes. Um, it wasn't really seen in men. But obviously there are lots of reasons with regards to menstrual blood loss and the fact that women are always borderline iron deficient. So they, they have almost no reserve. Uh, so as many as 25% of women athletes in multiple sports, so that there's 12-month-a-year uh, physical activity, uh, were found to be iron deficient, um, a fairly high percentage. Um, 
thoughts are that distance runners uh, may lose blood because of uh, literally the uh, cecum and the sigmoid colon flapping around uh, inside their abdomen as they run with microtrauma. Um, if anyone's ever looked at a, colonosco a colonoscopic photo, uh, it, it's incredible to me just how rich the uh, mucosal wall is in small blood vessels. And so it's very easy to imagine that the trauma of running uh, could cause a bleed. Um, the same goes true with regards to uh, the kidneys, which are bouncing up and down. I think there have been a number of studies about the presence of microscopic hematuria at people at the end of marathons, and it's essentially universal. So we know that that happens. There's um, a, a kind of anemia, which was actually described initially in uh, troops that were on uh, long-distance marches with packs. Uh, and there is something called foot strike hemolysis, pretty simple in concept again. Uh, repeated trauma to the bottom of the feet, blood vessels break, uh, and that hemoglobin is lost in the urine. And so uh, there, there is a relationship between uh, levels of physical activity and being iron deficient. I can testify to you that talking a long distance runner out of running is um, a waste of time. And so we've, uh, we agree <laughs> to uh, accept the fact that uh, the passion for running is uh, gonna persist and they're gonna continue running. And so we generally just uh, maintain them on intravenous iron um, as needed. One of the interesting things about an athlete that's iron deficient is that they can actually begin to sense it even before they become anemic because they're so used to uh, timing their performance. So if they know that they typically run, you know, a seven minute mile during a regular workout, I mean, they'll pick up immediately that they're running miles at maybe seven minutes and 15 seconds. So it's, it's interesting and I'll talk a little bit about the need for iron with regards to muscle metabolism. I wanna talk a little bit about this entity uh, which was a new one to me, and again is uh, the work of Dr. Hirschko. Um, and he defines an entity called autoimmune atrophic gastritis. Um, they tend to be younger, they tend to be women. Uh, infection with Helicobacter pylori is common, uh, and so those are part of the defining characteristics. The actual definition is that their serum gastrin is elevated. That's how one demonstrates that the patient is not producing enough acid, is that their gastrin goes up because that's, that's what that hormone does is it drives acid production. So uh, these are younger women. You can test for H. pylori. Uh, you can measure a gastrin level. What's interesting is that um, of the women that fit this uh, category and there are studies having to do with endoscopy that demonstrate uh, a chronic lymphocytic infiltrate of the gastric wall, um, that half of them have a low B12, and that um, a fair number of them also have intrinsic factor antibody. And that's what leads uh, him to think that this is probably an autoimmune process, that there may be antibodies not only against intrinsic factor, but there may be antibodies directed against the parietal cell, for instance. As everyone knows, with regards to pernicious anemia, there's an overlap with thyroid disease. 20% uh, of these women were hypothyroid due to antibodies. And there's this sort of uh, spectrum that he posits, which is the patients are either um, sort of atrophic, and they have a low B12, and they're a little bit older, or have this more active chronic gastritis, which means that they tend to have H. pylori, and they tend to be younger. But the idea that there are is, uh, in, in his research, this is by far the most common cause for unexplained iron deficiency, which is a disease of the wall of the stomach, not ulcerative or malignant, but absorptive disease of the lining of the stomach. Uh, and so uh, having just learned about this entity, I'm trying to keep that in mind as I see patients, and I ask you to do the same. Um, there are papers that show that treatment of uh, Helicobacter pylori does resolve iron deficiency. Uh, these were 24 patients that we reported in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, 
And as you can see, hemoglobin rose after treatment. Their MCV, the size of the red cell, improved and went back to normal, and their serum ferritin rose. These were not patients that were treated with supplemental iron. They simply had their helicobacter pylori treated, continued a regular diet, and they were able to begin resorbing iron and uh, correcting their own anemia. This is one where I get uh, primarily uh, older men that are getting anemic, um, and that is that, uh, as I think everyone knows, uh, the pathophysiology that one needs to have testosterone to drive your hemoglobin from 12 to 14, which is the only thing that distinguishes men from women when it comes to red cell production is the presence of testosterone. Not surprisingly, uh, if you lose that testosterone drive, your hemoglobin becomes what is then normal uh, for all men and women, which is a hemoglobin of 12. So this was a very large study done in Italy, kind of cute, called Chianti, but uh, they adjusted for an incredible number of factors, trying to make sure that they weren't overlooking secondary causes, and they looked at uh, men and women, uh, defining what a normal testosterone was in those, uh, both men and women, and the chances of uh, being anemic was five times greater in men if they had a low testosterone and six and a half times as common in women that have a low serum testosterone. And in, in this study that was published in the archives of internal medicine, they felt that it explained as much as 9% of all so far unexplained anemias in men. And I would say that uh, at least uh, five or six men a year, um, I see their, their anemia is due to low testosterone. Um, I haven't picked up, however, being in women because I haven't tested them for testosterone level. But in this particular study, they felt that that was a, a relatively common cause of uh, anemia. What does it mean to be iron deficient, even if it's not uh, resulting in anemia? Uh, we know that iron is used in DNA synthesis. It's part of the immune system. It's part of this complex electron transport uh, in the mitochondria. Um, there are studies that show that patients don't think as well if they're iron deficient. And there are lots of studies that show that patients are fatigued if they're iron deficient, but with a normal hemoglobin. This is the uh, electron uh, cartoon that shows you <laughs> why iron's important, but it has all to do with uh, generating the uh, free uh, hydrogen ions, which go into making uh, ATP. Um, and iron is vital in at least three of those steps. And so, uh, mitochondria do not work as well in an iron-depleted environment. Um, and that is, um, has a lot to do with the uh, fatigue that patients tell us about. Um, fatigue and iron deficiency without anemia has been studied. Uh, in some experiments with athletes, uh, giving them iron didn't seem to help with their exercise performance. Uh, there was one Swiss study that showed that people that were iron deficient but not anemic were helped uh, by giving them iron. And then there's a classic study in uh, patients with congestive heart failure uh, showing that their cardiac symptoms will improve with iron repletion. And I'll show you this uh, particular study. This was published in the New England Journal a few years ago. Um, these were patients with congestive heart failure and iron deficiency, and they were randomized to get intravenous iron or uh, placebo. Um, they were not anemic. When they were given uh, supplemental iron, their hemoglobins did not change. The red blood cells did not change, uh, but their ferritin rose considerably. And using either self-reports or using the New York Heart Association classification, there was improvement in patients uh, with both of those, whether they were anemic or not, uh, with the repletion of iron. And so uh, always something to keep in mind with your patient who says, I'm really fatigued. We, we all get a TSH. Generally, we all get a TSH every month. But if the TSH is normal, uh, one of the things you might want to consider is uh, getting a ferritin. Um, this was a study in which uh, premenopausal women 
uh, complained of fatigue, they had low ferritins, their hemoglobins were all above 12, they got iron or a placebo, uh, and in women that had ferritins above 15, you couldn't really make them feel any better. But in women who had normal hemoglobins, but they were iron depleted, so again, the electron transport in the mitochondria, the myoglobin in the muscles, uh, those women were definitely benefited uh, by getting uh, supplemental iron and being iron repleted. And this is that uh, particular study that shows that. Um, again, patients with uh, ferritins less than 15, uh, their fatigue levels went down. Uh, and if they received a placebo, uh, there wasn't any impact at all. And so um, that's something uh, that I'd encourage people to think about, especially if you have a young woman who's tired um, and it's not enough to just look at her hemoglobin and say, gee, that looks okay. Um, if that woman is iron depleted, um, there's a good chance that she will improve with uh, supplemental iron. A few more things. Uh, is there a better iron preparation? I have a real bias, so it took me a long time, but I found a paper that supported my bias. Um, and that's, that's hard academic work, but I was willing to do it. So this came from the Journal of the Indian Medical Association, uh, uh, but they actually compared using carbonyl iron, my favorite, uh, versus uh, ferrous fumarate. And the bioavailability of the carbonyl was considerably better. We've known that for a long time. But there were actually measurable changes in uh, hemoglobin and MCV and ferritin with carbonyl iron. Carbonyl iron is... Uh, is more expensive. It's not a prescription drug, but you do have to kind of spell it out. Uh, I began using it because there's far less GI distress with carbonyl iron than there is with the uh, much more widely prescribed iron sulfate. And I tell my patients I think it's worth the, uh, worth the cost. Uh, this is a, a comment with regards to how iron is delivered. Um, these are trials looking at uh, intravenous iron versus oral iron. This was a huge review of 103 trials of this question. Um, and uh, the bottom line is that the intravenous iron uh, didn't cause more adverse effects. There was no increase in infections. Um, and uh, people may remember that in uh, the lecture I gave about hepcidin, that uh, iron is required for uh, effective antibacterial activity. And that, obviously, it's not a problem with your stomach if you're getting your iron intravenously. So uh, iron is definitely uh, safe given intravenously, and we give um, a lot in our department. There are these different iron preparations. This one tends to be associated with arthralgias, um, and we, we're not using it in our department. This has become our uh, go-to drug uh, but uh, we're probably going to switch to uh, uh, an alternative, uh, both for ease uh, uh, of administration. Now, I'm going to go to something completely different. I'll try to go through this quickly and leave at least uh, you know five minutes for questions. And that is iron uh, excess, hemochromatosis. Uh, hemochromatosis, or an excess of iron, is... Uh, is uh, largely all genetic disorders. Uh, I mean, there are lots of other reasons for being iron overloaded, but when we talk about hemochromatosis, we're talking about uh, genetic disorders. The most common by far is a point mutation in the HFE gene. Um, very common uh, from those people with a Scandinavian background. Uh, one in 300 people have uh, carry at least one of these alleles. Uh, and, and, excuse me, and one in 300 actually are homozygous for the allele. So it's a very common, uh, very common mutation. There are point mutations in this factor uh, in the uh, HFE gene, which is a much milder wish factor. There's a mu mutations in the transferrin receptor in something called hepcidin and hemojuvalin, and then also in one called ferroprotin. And uh, those were all ones that I mentioned during the hepcidin. But they all have to do with iron transportation. This is the workup that's uh, suggested uh, uh, from an article uh, by Dr. Kamashella, who's sort of the hematology guru on uh, 
uh, hemochromatosis. There are lots of gastroenterologists that are expert as well. Um, if their transferrin saturation is more than 45% or their serum ferritin is over 200, um, that's where this starts. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, when should you look for hemochromatosis, but that's, that's the start of the algorithm here. You look for mutations. Uh, that's the first thing that you do. And then there are a number of things you can do screening the family. You can measure how much iron is in the uh, liver, um, either by MRI uh, or by liver biopsy. Squid is another kind of imaging technique. That is nothing uh, to do with uh, applying squids to people. Um, and then they define all of the different uh, categories here. And so there was a paper from the U.S. Uh, uh, Preventative Service for Healthcare, I think it is. I can never remember what all those initials are. But they basically, you know, at, were asked the question, I mean, this is really a common genetic abnormality. Should we start screening people? Um, and what's the chances of developing uh, clinically significant hemochromatosis in someone that is homozygous? 24% uh, of people are iron overloaded. Um, those are almost always men. Uh, menstrual blood loss from women is largely protective for the rest of their life. Um, only 6% of people develop fibrosis, and only 1.4% of people actually develop cirrhosis uh, as a result of hemochromatosis. Um, does earlier phlebotomy improve mortality or, or morbidity? Uh, Survival is the same if the patient doesn't have any cirrhosis. So you can't really make a survival argument. And are there certain groups that are at increased risk that can be identified before genetic screening, uh, before testing? And their, their bottom line is that they didn't think there was. There's enough uh, interracial and interethnic um, uh, marrying that uh, the distribution of the HFE gene mutation is too widespread. So th the bottom line is that no one's recommending that as a routine, once-in-a-lifetime care that people should be screened for hemochromatosis for a genetic mutation. There are two articles that came out uh, in 2008 that reached slightly different conclusions, but they looked at uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, and so their guidelines are slightly different, but if you, uh, if you wanted to screen for hemochromatosis as a public health matter, one of the recommendations would be to uh, only act on patients uh, who have a transferrin saturation of greater than 52%. Statistically, that's what it worked out to be. And it was especially powerful in men that were over the age of 25, so they've gone through their growth. They're going to start accumulating iron and that they're Northern European descent. Um, the other uh, algorithm or cut point was a serum ferritin greater than 1,000. So if you're going to screen with ferritin, it has to be above 1,000. And uh, the group that they would recommend targeting are adult men and women that are Caucasian because of the infrequency of the mutation in non-Caucasians. So if, if you ever get involved in a cocktail discussion about what should be the threshold for screening for hemochromatosis, um, you can tell them that you know of two. Managed known of hemochromatosis is uh, largely phlebotomy. Um, I think the change in practice has been that of uh, not trying to make people iron deficient, but to lower their ferritin below 50. And that's made a huge difference in the people that I take care of because in the old days, uh, hemochromatosis patients were all miserable because they were all iron deficient. They were tired, they had glossitis, they, they were anemic. Um, and so that it's, it's not necessary to make people iron deficient as long as you keep their ferritin below 50. Um, we talked before about proton pump inhibitors. Again, it is effective in reducing iron absorption in a patient who is iron replete or even iron excess. And uh, I have uh, a couple of patients who dislike uh, phlebotomy. And so they're on uh, long-term omeprazole, and it's uh, kept their ferritin low enough that they have not required phlebotomy for several years. So that is one thing that you can offer a patient that doesn't want to go through phlebotomy. Um, of course, you need to avoid iron, uh, limit alcohol, just 
in terms of liver injury, and then uh, there's a recommendation to avoid vitamin C because it may facilitate iron absorption. That's a chunk of iron from the sky. So, any questions? Yes? Do you use the carbonyl iron form in uh, pregnancy? I do. In fact, um, I, I learned from Tim that that's the form that's in the um, prenatal vitamin, which I hadn't realized. So uh, for a while, it, there was a shortage of carbonyl iron that you could just go buy, but apparently that's the, that's the form that iron is normally in, in the prenatal vitamins, which I didn't know about. So uh, I, I think it's kind of a done deal. At least that's what Tim was telling me. I, I haven't scoured the shelves. I don't know, Ann, do you, do you know if that's true? Thought it was ferrous sulfate? I did too, and then Tim told me that once. So, um, yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. When you tell people to get prenatal vitamins, do you tell them? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, there was one that Tim used, anyway, said that that's, that's what was in his. Yeah, Todd. If, if that gene is so uh, common in Scandinavians, is there some benefit to being um, heterozygote versus homozygote? Or does it yes, w which is um, uh, if, you're, if you're having lots of children and iron deficiency inhibits uh, pregnancy, which it does, um, it allows you to be more fertile if you can uh, maintain adequate iron stores. Yeah, Mike. Okay. What happens? So the question is, what is it about postural uh, uh, edemia? And it just has to do with the fact that if you're upright, um, you probably put at least a couple of liters in your legs. And as soon as you become supine, uh, all of that uh, plasma volume that's in the tissues of the legs uh, comes out. I mean, everybody has patients that say, boy, at the end of the day, my legs are swollen. I go to bed at night, and in the morning when I wake up, they're perfectly okay. So it's extremely common phenomena that uh, people will keep a couple of liters of fluid in their legs during the day. Hey, Don. Larry, what's the uh, current thinking on using that for transfusion, the phlebotomized blood for transfusions? Um, I wish I knew. I, I, no, you can't, Jamie, still? I thought there was a change in policy, but apparently not, Don. Yeah. It's been argued a long time. Forever, right? yeah, I know. And, and that was my understanding it was, and then I thought I'd talked to a patient that was a, a blood donor, and they said they could, but um, apparently not. Anything else? Thank you.